This is lecture five of the self-term circuits course. Uh, we will be covering the isochronic torque assumption and pre-charge half buffers. Uh, last time we covered weak condition half buffers, which is the kind of simplest pipeline stage that you can build. Uh, and we showed how these self-term circuits are built uh, as a collection of interacting cycles. So if one cycle here on the left, uh, another cycle here on the right, and they're synchronized by the C element, which waits for both of these cycles to be in the same spot before continuing on. Uh, so we're going to be modifying this weak condition half buffer a bit in order to try to uh, speed up the handshake, and also in order to expose uh, the, the primary timing assumption that we make in most uh, quasi-delay and sensitive circuits. And so the first thing that we'll notice is that we have this input uh, request, right? And this input request will trigger the output request. But in the weak condition half buffer, we also wait for the input request to reset before resetting the output request. If we want to reset the output request uh, in parallel, right? We don't want to wait for the input request to be reset then we can kind of, uh, do something special with the C element. So this C element, if we dig back into to, uh, what it looks like at the transistor level, uh, we have our upgoing, uh, you know, our pull-up network and our pull-down network, and we have the, the output uh, inverter with the, um, this is combinational feedback. And so, in order to avoid waiting for that uh, input request to reset, we would take this transistor, right? Basically waiting for L dot R to go low, resetting the input handshake, uh, and we'd remove it. And so now we can reset the output rail, uh, the output request before, you know, before the input request resets. Uh, so whenever R dot E goes low, uh, R dot R will go low and we don't wait for L. However, this breaks the cycle on the left-hand side. You can see we've, we've now got this only like only half the cycle is filled in here. And so we need to uh, add some circuitry to make sure that we don't have a broken cycle. So, this is where the isochronic fork assumption comes in. The assumption is basically that if there is a wire fork and one end of the wire fork does not acknowledge the transition driving the wire, then we assume that the transition on that unacknowledged fork reaches that gate C um, before the transition propagates through B uh, and then back into A, creating a glitch, right? We're just assuming that a glitch does not happen on this wire out to C. Does that make sense? So just to clarify, what is, uh, can you go over again, what error we are just assuming doesn't occur and what uh, that error might cause downstream? Right. So if, if acknowledgement is not maintained, the acknowledgement property that we talked about last lecture, um, in, which every, in which there is a cycle of gates from the output driver back to the input of the gate. So if that is not maintained, then the, um, the wire that doesn't acknowledge the transition can, can have a glitch propagate down the wire, right? And so effectively the, the transition propagates out of A, down B, all the way back to A, uh, in, inverting the transition and, and lowering it before the transition gets to C, right? And so we're just assuming that that glitch 
right? The upgoing and then the downgoing immediately doesn't happen. And so then an example of, uh, of how that glitch might propagate is if our fork here becomes a diamond and B e and C feed into a D later on. Yes. So we might make some assumption about D having two good inputs. In general, because C is a gate in the rest of the circuit, uh, and their and self time circuits are made up of cycles, then C will be part of some other cycle as well, and it will it will have to merge back into the rest of the circuit at some point. There will be a merge point, mm -hmm. and that's the point at which you know your your uh, instability will propagate out into the rest of the system. Okay. Jacob, is this making sense? Okay. And so our assumption is basically that this does not happen, right? So uh, the transition on the non-acknowledging end, C, has completed before the adversarial path, B, has triggered the conflicting transition on the isochronic fork, A. So we have this cycle that we need to fix and we need to fix it by creating an isochronic fork and so we we start by adding a gate um which takes the you know the request on l as an input uh and kind of com feeds back into uh, the original cycle before the inverter on LE. So we're basically just tying up this whole left side of the cycle and, and completing it. But we've still got you know, a piece of the cycle left over with this asymmetric C element and this extra uh, arc down to the C element driving LE. And so we need to add another gate in order to complete that piece of the cycle which is another C element taking RE and tying it together with the output LE. And so now we have three cycles, right? Three complete cycles. On the left, we have the input uh, on L. And then inside the process, we now have a cycle uh, with, uh, you know, these signals are, are called, uh, so this is like the enable, uh, these are some internal signals. And then on the right, we have a cycle with R. So now we have our pre-charge half buffer reshuffling, and it will allow us to uh, reset the output request before the input request is reset. So let's kind of work our way back and, and derive the uh, production rules from this. So from our asymmetric C element, uh, we're gonna call this input wire enable or EN. And so we have enable and L dot R, R dot R goes high. And then we have not enable and uh, that drives R dot R low. Then we take the C element down here and we take uh, the input request r dot r and the output request, or sorry, the input request l dot r and the output request r dot r, and that drives uh, our uh, l valid signal or l of e. We have our usual driver for l dot e, and then we have the final C element, which is taking in the two enables, l e and r e, and driving the enable signal. So these are production rules for the pre-charge half buffer. So just as a matter of syntax, uh, here with R dot R plus, so that's gonna be the reset line on the right uh, process. At the first line, so enable and L dot R, mm -hmm. then setting R dot R plus. Yep. And so then on the second line where we have uh, LV plus, yep. so is there a difference in syntax here with the dot versus uh, the 
subprint, basically. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, dot means that the signal here belongs to the channel R. The R is a, effectively a structure or a record, however you want to think about it. Um, LV is just a, a, a signal that's internal to the process. Okay. So then we'll have to uh, presumably declare that yes. LV exactly. as an internal variable. Yep. Okay. All right. So here we are uh, in async course. We boot up the tool set and let's go into lecture five. So we have one example, e1.act. And our goal is to build a pre-charge half buffer. Uh, now we've added this add variables as needed. Make sure to uh, properly reset the, the pre-charge half buffer. Uh, and then we can go and simulate it. And so we've got the uh, process definition for the PCHP up here. We've got the source and the sync, just like in the previous examples. And then we instantiate everything. So we have globals here, the two channels, L and R, the source, the sync, and we instantiate our device under test. Uh, like the other examples, we have, a, we have included channels.act, which is just the E101. And we've included globals.act, which is our uh, power rails and reset rails. Finally, we have e1.rc, which just sets up reset and then advances 100 steps. So I will let you work on e1 uh, and let me know how it goes. Uh, since I forget in the last lecture whether you went over the rules regarding reset um, and how to think about when that when the where those would be inserted. I did. Yeah, the on this exercise, the reset rules are gonna be interesting. So definitely a good thing to know. As you're building these production rules, try to keep the production rules in the order in which you imagine that they will execute in the cycle. That will help think about the handshake expansion as you're building these. So, for example, here, I know that the first thing that will happen is L.R will go high. And that will drive R.R high here. The next thing that happens is that R.R drives L.V LV high here, right, just following the cycle, which drives LE down, which drives enable down. And we're now here. Enable down drives R dot R low, which drives L V low, which drives L E high, which drives enable high, and we're up the next cycle. And so these production rules are ordered in the order of the handshake. So while you guys are doing that, I'm gonna fill in the the production rules sans reset. So the first thing that we have is our forward driver. Remember, we need to use the internal node underscore RR um, so that we don't, so that we have CMOS implementable production rules. Then we have LV, L.R and R to R. Problem is LV is also not the correct sense. So we need to create an internal variable for that underscore LV, which is pulled down. Uh, then we drive L.E, 
using LV. Then we have our enable, not L.E and not R.E. And it also is not the correct sense. And so we need to create an internal node for, an, for enable. And that brings us to the reset phase of our handshake. So we use uh, our downgoing rule on enable to drive underscore rr, which drives r dot r low. Then we have LV and it's symmetric. Then we have LE, which is symmetric. And finally, we have enable, which is symmetric. And so that is our production rule set, but we haven't done reset yet. So let's take a look at our circuit. We want R dot R to go low. And it's driven in two places here with the inverse of enable and here with enable and L dot R. You'll notice that enable is on both sides of the C element. And enable is a signal which we can reset. It's another state holding signal. And so if we reset enable low, this rule will be prevented from firing because enable disables the pull down rule for underscore RR. And this rule will fire on reset. So we don't have to drive reset for the output node directly. Instead, we can take a step back to our enable gate and reset it low, right? So here enable is low. We wanna make sure that this production rule fires on reset. And so we say not g dot underscore s reset four. So that forces this production rule to fire on reset. Remember, underscore s reset is the inverse. And then over here, we want to prevent this rule from firing on reset. And so we say g dot underscore s reset and. And so that resets enable low on reset. We still have one more gate to cover, and that is LV. Now we know because r dot r is reset low from our previous work that this production rule driving l dot lv high is already turned off during reset because r dot r will be low so all we need to do is drive this during reset we can do that using not g dot underscore p reset. And we use the p rather than s here because we don't have the combinational, the other side of the reset rule. Can you elaborate on that? Can on the other side of the reset rule? So p and s reset are driven at different times uh, because it's again, it's an isochronic fork, but it's an isochronic fork on, on the reset signal. And so we need to drive S reset long before we ever drive P reset in order to make sure that we don't cause interference during reset. So we have this separate signal P reset for when we're using the isochronic fork side of the reset signal. So then if we were to look at our 
pre-charge half buffer diagram. Mm -hmm. Okay, pull it up. When the S research signal is injected, mm -hmm. that's going to be on the. So this is LB. Yes. This is enable. Mm -hmm. So S reset will affect this. Yes, on the input side of I. On the input side of what will also be the R channel. Yes. Okay. And so we need to assert it in order for the reset to propagate out through here and into here to prevent the downgoing rule of LV, or sorry, the upgoing rule of LV to be enabled during P reset. Mm -hmm. And then P reset though is a signal injected uh, on the output of A into C. Yes. Okay. And because they're on the output of A into C, we have the isochronic fork that we need to. Uh, so this is not, it's not the same as this isochronic fork. It's an isochronic fork on the reset signal itself. Okay. And this reset signal is, to what degree is the reset signal an artifact of our simulation versus actually present in the uh, circuit that we're implementing? It is absolutely necessary for it to be present in the layout and actual circuit that you print. Okay. Because when you turn on the chip, all of these state holding elements will be every which direction. Mm -hmm. And so then this diagram here, if we were to elaborate a bit more with more wires, would have some sort of control plane, control plane with reset signals. Yes. Uh, interspersed. And power. Yes. Okay. The way I have it written, because I've I'm trying to figure out. I'm trying to now kind of figure out how all this works is we're resetting L dot E to high, right? So you reset so it appears. Yeah. You reset the this. No, I, I'm resetting it the proper way. I'm just saying after everything propagates through the like three inverters that it's going through. Um mm -hmm. L dot E ends up being high, right? After reset? Yes, exactly. Okay. And and then enable is set to low, and then enable help makes R dot R behave. So yes. why do we want L dot E to be reset to high? Um, it's not required that we have L dot E reset to high. It just so happens that the optimal uh, reset configuration that requires the fewest number of transistors sets L dot E to high. Okay, so you set it to high to minimize transistor count, not because it's required for the logic. Correct. I guess. Okay. If it were to be reset low, then as soon as you come out of reset, L dot E will go high as a result of the handshake. Okay. And let's run it. Let's see what we got. I'm going to call make. Uh, enable does not exist in current scope. I forgot to create the signal for enable and for LV. Call make. All right, we've compiled it. We have e1.prs. And we have e1.rc, so I can say prsim e1.prs source e1.rc, and it'll start running. And so we, when we boot up the chip, VDD goes one. Uh, our reset signals go into reset, so reset is enabled. And as a result, our underscore the first thing that happens is our underscore enabled goes to one. Our enable goes low, driving R dot R low. And R dot E goes to one as a result of R dot R. Now we cannot necessarily depend on this because our downstream 
uh, processes may have their own reset behavior. So underscore LV goes to one as a result of reset, driving LV low and LE high. Then we lower our P reset. And finally, we lower our reset. And the circuit starts going. Right? And so we get our handshake with the input request goes high, the output request goes high, the output enable goes low, the input enable goes low, input request resets, output request resets, and output enable goes high, input enable goes high. And we start over again. There's the beginning of our next handshake. And so we can kind of watch this go forever. We hit cycle and off it goes. So let's see the analog simulation. We go into E1, PRSIM, env.prs, source, prsim.rc. And so it loads netlist and starts running the simulation. We have our output, test.spy.prn, we can view. And let's bring in our signals. So we have LR and LE. We have RR and RE. And then we have uh, enable and LV. And we have their internal nodes as well. So let me put those in. The internal node RR, the internal node for EN, and the internal node for LV. So here's reset. Reset is high. Um, and then as soon as reset goes low, we have transitions start happening as a result of L.R. So L.R. Uh, was high, and immediately R.R. goes high on reset being disabled. Does that analog behavior make sense? Feels like mine's not, doesn't look like yours. Hold on. We can move some of these converted signals into the, in with their, uh, their non inverted drivers. Yeah. I have a duplicate, it looks like. File. And then we can move RR into here so we can see what's going on. That's not what I intended to tag. L R L 
E underscore R R R R R E and then underscore L V. LV is here. Underscore enable and enable. There we go. LR is high. Drives underscore RR low. Drives RR high which drives LV low, or underscore LV low, driving LV high. And then we get the reset behavior enabled. I must have skipped the set behavior unenabled. Uh, so if I do current draw through ground, so all the, the current passing through ground, then you can see the power usage of the chip of the of this buffer. And you'll notice that there's no clock, so it just kind of it's dependent upon the amount of switching activity that's going on.